the basic idea that I'm uh, pursuing here in this, uh, in this lecture and in this uh, review uh, is one about delivery. Jeff just described my own experience over the last 30 years, starting medical school in the fall of 1984 to now. Uh, anyone who has done this or, or in these recent decades have, has seen the same thing that I have, which is a revolutionary series of changes, many of them coming from basic science and uh, pursued uh, by the pharmaceutical and biotech industries and developed as products. That, th this is not going to be the primary focus of my remarks. I'm going to focus more on delivery and some of the lessons that we've learned over the last 25 years, again, in seeking to deliver healthcare services uh, in settings of, of poverty. Now, going back as one does in uh, thinking about the Shattuck lecture, uh, the 1907 lecture was delivered by Frederick Shattuck, who was the younger brother, if I'm not mistaken, and if I am, I'm sure there are always historians around with the Mass Medical Society to correct one. I think he was the younger brother of uh, George Shattuck, who gave the inaugural le uh, lecture on influenza. The Shattuck the Younger chose to address tuberculosis, which had gravely afflicted uh, their family, as it had so many others. The younger Dr. Shattuck spoke confidently about the disease. It may be broad, this is quoting him, it may be broadly stated that 50, within 50 years, he was looking back actually, both the public and the medical prevention regarded tuberculosis as incurable. Efforts were practically confined toward making the patient comfortable and prolonging his life in a small way toward preventing and in a small way towards preventing the spread of the disease, seldom curing it. Shattuck, bemused by the superstitions of previous practice, wrote four decades before the discovery of the first drug shown to be effective against tuberculosis. But he got some things right, as I hope to do, in considering the lessons that we've learned uh, regarding delivery of services in settings of poverty. Now looking at the big picture, which we're supposed to do, uh, shows very encouraging signs. This is one of my favorite slides, which I stole from my colleague Joe Radigan. Things not so good for the last 10,000 years for the species. <laughs> Life expectancy hovering around 25 years. And then suddenly, boom. And we know in medicine that the reasons for this remarkable improvement in life expectancy are due to a host of factors. Um, they include nutrition, sanitation, for, so what FDR would have called freedom from want and other kinds of violence that plague people. Uh, it's also due in part to the delivery of medical services, preventive, diagnostic, therapeutic. And the way to see how powerful our contribution as a profession can be is probably to go to some of the places where we've worked where there has not been delivery of medical services and there suddenly can be. Now about tuberculosis, Shattuck cited one 19th century French doctor who he called, by the way, more hopeful than the rest. And this French doctor asserted there are two kinds of consumption. That of the rich, which is sometimes, and that of the poor, which is never cured. The role of equitable access to, to medicine in accounting for these trends have been the, has been the subject of brisk debate well before our treatments were really effective. So the equity concerns predate any effective delivery capacity on our part beyond basic public health and sanitation methods. And they're going to become more and more important and these voices raised for equity louder and louder in the coming years. Now, one of the reasons they're becoming louder is because of new innovations in communication. We can hear and see just about everything. I mean, I would not have imagined when I was in the ICU with Jeff, doing a good job, I might add, what is with this 
pen, no pension for ICU care. <laughs> First in, last out, you told me. Now, I would not have imagined then, 20 some odd years ago, standing in the Brigham, that we could be hearing a lecture given by someone uh, in Haiti. I just gave grand rounds last Monday in Haiti, and it was seen in Boston, in New, uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, and in Rwanda. That just would not have occurred to me. This communication ability renders many, many things vivid and clear. We can read about, just in the last decade, for example, about polio in Pakistan and the killing of community health workers seeking to diminish it. We can contemplate, still over a decade, some millions of deaths in childbirth. And then we all know about newly complex epidemics that are caused by old scourges like Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. They're newly complex because they're mutating and changing. Uh, 50 years ago, at, the, at a place like the Brigham, maybe 60 years ago, um, not, most all staph infections would have been susceptible to relatively low doses of penicillin. Now, of course, 95% of them, I don't know the latest number, are not. So that, there are old problems that still require attention. There are new problems. I am going to talk a little bit about AIDS, and, but one could just as uh, easily talk about SARS or H1N1 influenza. And then there are old problems turned newly complex, such as drug-resistant disease. Drug-resistant chronic infectious disease, whether due to a virus, a bacterium, a mycobacterium, or a virus, ha can teach us a lot about how to deliver care for other chronic diseases of non-infectious etiology, and that's what I hope to show today. Now, I'm going to use the words effective and delivery a lot in this essay and in, the, in this uh, lecture because the effectiveness and delivery parts are important and really quite under-attended. They're not well studied. Um, if you look at the triumphs, and there have been many, of modern medicine, a lot of them, as I said, come from this first D, basic science discovery. And anyone who is a clinician or who cares about delivery knows that a lot of our most powerful interventions come from this source and that they need to be developed as products or deliverables uh, over time. And that is not an easy uh, process, nor is the regulatory science necessary to govern it. Straightforward. But the least well-studied part of our profession, broadly conceived, is delivery. We just don't study uh, delivery, in part comparing it to elegant science or rigorous clinical trials. On the other hand, there's messy, everyday delivery. And so this bias against serious scrutiny of delivery, how does it work, how does it not work, it needs to be overcome uh, in medicine, and it is being overcome by journals who acknowledge that these are really important questions, and some of us would argue perhaps the most, most important questions. Now, the, there is also, and I, I give an example here which you've heard before. Um, it is probably 1965, it's well known, it's become, it becomes known that a beta, beta blocker after MI will reduce mortality. But a study um, which, and you can find others, a study of rollout of beta blocker in one large study of elderly Americans showed that two decades later only 50% of them could be reliably expected to be placed on a beta blocker. And that's the delivery gap, right? Or some, I'm going to call it here today the no-do gap. We know a lot about what to do. But delivering on that is never straightforward and has not been the subject of much serious inquiry in uh, academic medicine. Now the good news, or some good news, is that taking, going back to the acute MI uh, example, mortality from acute MI has continued to drop across the United States, leading uh, Tom Lee and Jim Mongan, who we all miss, to note that fatalism is leaving medicine. And the other example, which again my 
colleagues in, at the Brigham might not like too much, which is to suggest that we have higher rates of bloodstream infection than our friends at the Fruit Street Clinic. <laughs> but what this study shows, of course, is that the fatalism that all of us have felt at one time or another in our clinical practice, whether in an ICU or in a squatter settlement in Haiti, is being undermined by development of effective diagnostics and therapies, but also by the proper delivery of some of, by bridging this no-do gap. And I think that's what makes this the most exciting profession in the world, or in history for that matter, because now we finally have the tools that someone like either George or Frederick Shattuck did not have and could only dream of. Now, let me go back to what I think, um, certainly what inspired Jeff to in invite me to give this lecture, and that is our experience uh, in places quite different from the Brigham or the Mass General. When we talk about the no-do gap in a place like rural Haiti, which I will do in a second, there's no way you would imagine that this gap was being bridged. But it's not only rural areas, and it's not only patients who lack diagnoses. A colleague of ours uh, from Kenya did a study uh, of, this is a neurologist working in Nairobi. He did a study in an a neurology clinic, in a subspecialty care clinic in the city, of patients with a diagnosis of epilepsy who had already been prescribed and were on medications for their disease. And he just did something very simple that's been done in studies of uh, adherence to antihypertensives and certainly in, uh, in my field, which is tuberculosis, and that is, okay, of you patients on therapy, how many of you have therapeutic blood levels of the agent that we've given you in your blood? And the answer in this particular instance is zero. Was zero. None of them did. And none of them had super th therapeutic levels. They all had subtherapeutic or absolutely no trace of an acti active anti-seizure medicine in their bloodstream. And that's the no-do gap. Now that's in a city. In fact, it is in East Africa's most cosmopolitan city. That's what Nairobi looks like on one side. On the other side are the kind of places that Partisan Health works, and many of our colleagues from the Brigham and Harvard Medical School, we work in, often in rural villages. Now you'd imagine, of course, that the no-do gap in that instance would be even more difficult to bridge. Uh, but that doesn't need to be the case, as we've seen. In fact, it often has not been the case. We have seen in settings uh, marked by deep poverty the, our ability collectively, we're, and I'll describe the collective, to bridge no-do gaps and to improve the quality of delivery, in some instances, instances achieving clinical outcomes that are superior to those documented in the United States and Europe. And I'll, I'm going to back that up with a couple of examples. The second point I'd like to underline is really about a system of care. Uh, we know, we think we know what a system of care is. Um, it's a health care system, the way that, a, um, for example, a public and private parts of the system fit together. But I'm describing something a little bit more simple and straightforward in this lecture. And that is a system that includes hospitals for those who need them, and clinics for a majority of clinical services can be uh, administered in a place like a clinic, and finally, community-based care, which is delivered with the help of community health workers. And that's going to be one of the lessons that I will draw in contemplating our work with AIDS and tuberculosis, and one that I believe is deeply uh, important to contemplate here in the United States. That is, the complementary home-based care with the assistance of community health workers who complement what complement the services of doctors and nurses and others. Now, um, moving, moving to this example of tuberculosis, or back to the example of tuberculosis, I'm, I'll look uh, very briefly at uh, AIDS and hepatitis C as well. Last year, we, um, Salman Kajavi and I wrote a review for um, the journal uh, 
calling tuberculosis the midwife of modern medicine. And I'll just repeat very briefly what we meant. Tuberculosis was the, um, a century ago, uh, the time of Shattuck and afterwards, in, in a sense, uh, an important, uh, it was a leading uh, killer of young adults in Boston at that time, including members, as I said, of the Shattuck family. It was a chronic disease. It is a chronic disease, killing slowly. And it was only slowly understood in scientific and medical circles to be caused by an airborne pathogen. And you know the story of Robert Koch's discovery, which focused generations of researchers uh, on the quest for microbes and helped to establish microbiology as a field and to focus attention on the quest for compounds that might kill the microbes but not the host. Now, the 1944 discovery of streptomycin herald, heralded the beginning of the antibiotic era. And since I've already been given a chance uh, by Jeff to uh, describe this in the journal, I'm going to speed up this part of the presentation. This is a patient uh, in Russia. But immediately after we, I wasn't around in 1944, but our profession began using streptomycin. One of the first things we saw, there are t tuberculosis experts in the room today who know this well, was relapse of patients. And the question was raised immediately, what was going on? Did the drug itself, which like penicillin, was cultivated from a living organism, change? Or were the patients changing? And many observers began to su suspect correctly that the tubercle bacillus was mutating, and this is at the beginning of the story in 1944, was beginning, was mutating in ways that rendered the new drug ineffective. It was primarily the microbes and not the host or the drug which were changing at the molecular level, although all three were changing in this and other respects. Now the next chapters of this story are, are grimly predictable and they were predicted. Let me just use, go back to this 3D schematic that I laid out earlier. Many new discoveries, especially of new antibiotics, as opposed to preventives or, uh, or diagnostics, there was no vac effective vaccine, followed streptomycin. The same pattern emerged. Optimistic claims of a miracle cure to a growing awareness of the organism's ability to mutate in response to selective pressure from antibiotics. This was going to be observed following the development of all anti-infectives, all the tuberculosis drugs, certainly, but also those shown to be effective against important um, viral and, uh, and uh, parasitic causes of death and disability. Now, how could that have been prevented or slowed? Well, if we had a very good delivery system and knowledge that would emerge during the course of basic research which showed that combination chemotherapy was the way to treat at least chronic infections, and many of us would argue all serious infections. If we'd known that and had the drugs and they were developed at the same time, we would have slowed the emergence of drug resistance. But of course, that is not how development of drugs occurs. It occurs piecemeal. Also, stronger national systems, even in the affluent countries, in which post-war African countries in which uh, antibiotics were, were developed, were very slow to develop. And I mention programs because, of course, with a chronic disease, delivery of care is immediately and thought, seen to be a very important part of care because you're talking about treating uh, patients for 18 to 24 months. This is prior to the development of rifampin. So what happened was a, the chaotic way that this ensued was the serial uh, introduction of new agents, which was often tantamount to adding a failing drug, uh, a single drug to a failing regimen. And of course, this would not only fail clinically very often, but would lead to more resistance. And it got even more complicated. By the time we learned that multi-drug regimens and close supervision at the community level were the way to ensure treatment, uh, the drug resistance cat was out of the bag. And it took a lot of investment in building that system in the public sector, uh, very often with uh, help from 
uh, many partners. It took a lot of investment in build, to build that system and to learn how to dr deliver the drugs with close supervision at the community level. And that led to a lot of good outcomes for tuberculosis, which was declining for many reasons already noted. And you know, as far as drug resistance goes, Dr. Shattuck made the following point in 1907. Just as we have begun to see that climate is not, and he meant the, the uh, prevailing obsession with going off to Arizona, or I mean, I don't share that obsession, actually, of going off to Arizona. <laughs> no offense against Arizona. Uh, of going off to have a climate uh, treatment, which is very much in vogue. He said, just as we're beginning to see that climate is only an indirect means for the treatment of cases of tuberculosis, that there is no part of the world where the disease does not exist if favorable conditions are present or are introduced. Uh, great advance, this was his point that I was trying to underline, excuse me, is made in home treatment, which must and should be the only treatment for the great majority of cases. In other words, he was saying we don't need sanatoria and hospitals to treat patients with tuberculosis. It should be done at home. It's a chronic disease. Now, combination chemotherapy also offered the chance of saving lives and doing it in a manner much more convenient than, uh, than what was required by going away to a sanatorium. But again, the advent of effective chemotherapy did not lead directly to an effective delivery system. And Shattuck also guessed, he said the following, it's not, is it not possible, he asked, that more resistant and virulent strains may develop. This is prior to develop any effective antibiotics. Now, you've already heard my argument, the hypothesis of this, of this lecture is that this pattern of stuttering development of drugs, failure to introduce them effectively through a system that can reach patients in their homes, would be repeated again and again with every major discovery and every major epidemic of chronic infectious disease. So why did, was it difficult to dispel the myths that had arisen? Some of these myths in tuberculosis, and I'll just give a couple of examples. The idea, for example, that natural infection confers lasting immunity. The idea that one can only be sick with one strain of tuberculosis. The idea that drug resistant strains are somehow uh, less virulent or readily transmitted or not virulent or not transmitted at all. All of these myths had to be addressed and molecular methods are helping us to understand much more clearly uh, how biosocially complex epidemics of drug resistant and drug susceptible tuberculosis occur. There were also <coughs> other reminders and I'll just, uh, many of you have seen this before, reminders in more recent years included major outbreaks of, of tuberculosis, including drug-resistant tuberculosis, in almost all of our cities in, in, this, in this country and in many across the world. The simple explanation, which of course proved to be false, was that this was caused by HIV. It was actually caused by a complex series of invent, events that ranged from the advent of HIV, uh, but included uh, policies such as the war on drugs, which led to a major rise in the number of young people uh, uh, incarcerated in these cities in the United States, and also complicated by a sharp decrease in funding for public tuberculosis clinics. And the list goes on, by the way, in, in poor infection control at the top of, of, of this list. But this complex series of events led to major epidemics, but these were turned around by the opposite engagements in terms of investment for public health systems. This New York epidemic has taught us, however, a great deal that we now need to bring into play in contemplating much larger epidemics elsewhere. Now, um, let me just summarize, skip ahead, the lessons, some of the lessons that I will try to lay out in the written version of this talk. The first is that Drug resistance, this is just drawing lessons from uh, the tuberculosis experience. Well, first of all, drug resistant, 
drug resistance is here to stay. The question is, and this will hold for the other pathogens examined as well, the question is how can we decrease the rate of acquisition of resistance and transmission of drug resistant strains? Again, I'm, I'll, I'll stick with tuberculosis for a little bit. By the way, I want to I want to say, as I do uh, in this paper, that my comments here are based on a lot of experience providing community-based care to patients with highly drug-resistant TB. In fact, Partners in Health has treated in Peru, Haiti, Russia, Rwanda, Lesotho, uh, over 15,000 patients uh, with uh, laboratory-confirmed highly drug-resistant TB. So these comments about the lessons learned are from trying to build and roll out uh, platforms, and I'm going to call them delivery platforms, to treat patients with this disease. Now there are millions, I'm afraid, of these patients, which is, should be frightening to all of us. Um, I'll just mention a study published last summer in the journal. Jeff and I were recently in Beijing, which I confess is where I read this some months later, not when it came out. It was published last summer, and it's a large study of over 3,000 patients with newly diagnosed tuberculosis and close to 900 patients with previously treated tuberculosis in, in, uh, in China. And in 2007, first of all, they showed very poor outcomes. They used hospitals, like so many other, as in so many other settings. They did not use community health workers or community-based care, but hospitals. They, show, they concluded that the majority of these cases were primary transmission, uh, primary, sorry, primary infection. I'm not on call, am I? This is not a tip for you, Jeff. Um, that, the, that the majority of uh, patients had primary drug-resistant infection as opposed, of course, to acquired um, uh, drug-resistant infection, disease, rather. And uh, they estimated in this study 110,000 incident cases for that year alone and close to 10,000 cases of incident XDRTB, which was the latest rebuke to optimism by those of us who like to name pathogens, X standing for extensively. I can also find examples for you of TDR TB, which is totally drug resistant, which sounds a lot to me like something my teenage daughter would say. <laughs> so first point that I want to make is, is that this problem cannot be wished away. What we can do, as we try to do with the bacterial pathogens like SAF, is slow the rate of resistance and integrate prevention with care. Now that may seem obvious to members of Mass Medical Society, why would you not integrate prevention and care? But as I'll show you, there's many claims made that we can't afford care for people living in poverty. And this has been, in fact, the mantra of many arguing that we can't afford to invest in taking care of patients already sick with multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Let me just give you a pretty scary image. This is um, from a book that, uh, uh, about global health that we've just finished writing. The vast majority of these, of this, of these patients um, are not receiving any care, any effective care. They're rece everyone receives care all the time from someone, right? From their family members, from somebody who pays attention. But they're not receiving effective care for their active multi-drug resistant TB. And most of these patients, of course, have active infectious multi-drug resistant TB. So no wonder the authors of the New England Journal study concluded, the Chinese study, that China already has a serious MDR-TB problem. And so, of course, does Russia and India and many other places with resources to respond to this epidemic, but without the delivery system that they need in order to do so effectively. A second point that I'd like to make is that even though we're always late in medicine to deliver on equity, to deliver, to create equity, platforms for equity, which I'm, I'm going to describe even uh, more dramatically, I hope, in, in looking at AIDS very quickly, the possibility for terrific outcomes 
uh, is very high in settings of poverty as long as what we're delivering is clinically effective. And this is, may also seem an odd thing to add, but a lot of what gets uh, advocated is not clinically effective in Boston and it's not going to be clinically effective in rural Haiti either. I'll give an example. Third point which I've made fairly uh, repeatedly is to be effective with chronic disease in general we need to shift away from hospital and clinic based care to home based care and, and I, I've argued too with the help of community health workers. And then the fourth point is what happens when we do get new innovations? I could go back to my own field and talk about bedaclinin, a new agent that's very likely to have, a, uh, that has been shown to be effective against drug resistant tuberculosis. What is our plan for a new agent like that? Or how about the new protease inhibitors uh, that are shown to increase rates of cure for patients with chronic hepatitis, uh, hepatitis C infection uh, by as much as, two, by twofold. So we, we really need in medicine, a lot of us believe, to it doesn't matter what we call it, we don't have to call it an equity plan if that doesn't suit us, but we need one because that's in part how we will be judged uh, by future generations. How well do we do delivering on the promise of science and scientific development for people who didn't have ready access to care? Finally, and I, again, this may seem unusual to all of you, but the way we use the word untreatable, uh, whether um, contemplating a malignancy in rural Rwanda, or extensively drug resistant disease in Lesotho, or AIDS, as I'll show you in a second, across a continent much affected, the idea of the way that untreatable has been used has been not been good for patients, nor has it been accurate. Um, I could give the example of the treatment outcomes for untreatable extensively drug uh, XDR TB patient is the shorthand. The very fact that we call it untreatable signals that we don't believe that clinical interventions are going to be effective. But when we look back at our large Peru cohort of patients already treated for MDR TB or the Russian cohort of patients already treated for MDR TB, we found nothing of the sort. Because if it, they were untreatable, you'd expect the cure rate to be zero. But often the cure rate for the XDRTB patients, in some instances, in some settings like Peru, exceeded 50%. So what we were talking about, of course, is untreated, not untreatable. And if time permitted, I'd go through examples um, from uh, cancer care as well. Now. Let me just uh, skip ahead um, to HIV disease because that this was an important part, certainly, of my own experience, as, as Jeff said, ending up in Haiti at the same time that this new epidemic was described in the med biomedical literature. The same five lessons hold just as well for AIDS, but with a greater dose of optimism. Um, in, the in the course of 30 years, we've gone from this mystery um, to identifying, I love how we get to say in medicine, we've done this, as if I had done the early laboratory work myself when I was 23. Our profession, working with laboratory science, working with uh, basic investigators, have gone from a mystery to the identification of the pathogen, an understanding of the pathogenesis, and the development of effective combination chemotherapy in the course of 30 years. So this scientific progress between discovery and development of new tools was very fast in the case of AIDS. But the most astounding thing to all of us still, we just can't believe it, is that the delivery part has also been sped up. I just was sitting next to Tad Campion and uh, remembered a piece that I wrote for him and, and, and for the journal not, not a decade ago with the title the major infectious diseases of the world to treat or not to treat. Now I think you can guess where I came down on that rhetorical question, which by the way, these were used much more common by previous shatter speakers than yours truly meaning rhetorical questions. There's a whole bunch of them in there. But the, this progress was linked in a way that has not been described yet for tuberculosis uh, in the case of HIV disease. Now for me, uh, 
having started medical school in 1984, by the time ART rolled around, which is uh, 10 years later, I had gone through my internship and residency at the Brigham and had started an infectious disease fellowship where I was very interested in ICU patients, Jeff, not to <laughs> insist over much. I spent a hell of a lot of time in your ICU, I might add. Not that, not that anyone there ever had a drug-resistant infection of any sort. But when I was uh, beginning uh, my ID fellowship, something marvelous happened. Our teaching hospitals, and this was true at the Deaconess, the BI, Mass General, they, the patients who were dying in those hospitals with advanced HIV disease got up and walked home, a lot of them. And the hospitals cleared out. I mean, I can remember the floors on the Brigham where uh, previously we'd had nurses and staff and, and physicians who um, really knew how to take good care of inpatients with HIV disease, but the patients went home. Now, I was going, as Jeff said, between Harvard and Haiti, Harvard and Haiti, all those years. And so when in 1995, finishing my ID fellowship, somebody would ask me, and um, how long before people in Haiti know about the development of effective antiretroviral therapy? I said, they already know. Because anything that happens in one part of the global economy, especially if it involves suffering people who are young, their families are going to find out. And that's even much more true today with a more effective communication. Cell phone penetration in Haiti and everywhere else we've worked in Africa has been profound. So seeing that, I was very skeptical, I have to say, about the admonition that it we needed to prove that you could do this, that you could uh, use ART in Haiti. Why? Because we've been treating tuberculosis for years. And how do you treat tuberculosis by the method I've just suggested? A multi-drug regimen delivered to patients in their homes with the help of community health workers and adequate social support. And that's exactly what we argued should be done around HIV disease. Now, it was a very tough debate, um, and some of you will remember, uh, remember this. I mean, why else would Dr. Campion invite me to write an article entitled To Treat or Not to Treat? Because the debate was, was raging and difficult, and, uh, and it's, it's changed radically in that last decade. So how did, how did that happen? Well, first of all, let me just see, show you what it was like inside the clinic in Haiti. This is a, a small hospital by this point. Now, uh, I mean, as I'm going to mention, it become a big hospital. The idea at the time is that, that it wasn't cost effective or feasible or sustainable to use antiretroviral therapy, the standard of care in Africa, let's just say, because that was most often the subject of debate. We should just content ourselves with diagnosing and treating opportunistic infections. That would be work enough. I mean, why were we always asking for more? And it's true that of the patients we were seeing, half of them had active tuberculosis. This was a piece that I published in AIDS Clinical Care in 1997 because the editor, some of you know Deborah Cotton, uh, wanted it to be there and understood that given the limitations on laboratory capacity, we couldn't confirm all of these diagnoses. Um, but we knew what was going on, and so we said, okay, we're going to treat the patients with TB and HIV disease, again, with that same model, very complex. I'm sure you're all going to have to write it down, put pills in hands of community health workers who help patients adhere to care, community-based care. Now, between 1998 and 2003, we weren't winning this argument about rollout of ART in settings of great poverty. We weren't winning. We were making the argument, but I can just tell you, all you have to do is look at the numbers of patients who needed this, the only treatment we have, and how many were receiving it. Like the MDR-TB patients, it was a tiny, tiny number. In Haiti, certainly, which then was the hemisphere's country most affected by HIV disease. The only patients, I think, who were receiving care were either those who were wealthy enough to pay for it, again, not patients I ever met, 
uh, out in rural Haiti, or those receiving care through Partners in Health programs. So we ended up looking at the outcomes and divided our patients into those who receive ART and treatment of care, diagnosis and care for their opportunistic infections, and those for whom received, received free diagnosis and care of opportunistic infections, but were not in the catchment area where we worked, where we had community health workers. And of course, we find something, found something that would surprise no one. High rates of mortality, among patients who received everything but the ART, antiretroviral therapy, and almost no mortality in the patients who received ART plus the other parts of the therapy. In other words, the argument that we could ever make do with less than the standard of, of care wasn't really true clinically, and it had been underpinned by a falsehood, a clinical falsehood, and really the argument was all about, of course, one thing, and that was resources for care. By the way, I told you that our model of care was very complicated, and you might want to take notes, so I've taken a picture of it. Community, health worker, patient. This is actually a picture from Rwanda, and I'll show you some of our outcomes in a second. But if we have achieved almost universal access to Rwanda in Rwanda to antiretroviral therapy for AIDS, which is the only country, in, uh, one of only two countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in, in Sub Africa to do so. It's all been in the last year, and it's been with the help, not of infectious disease specialists, although we've tried to help, but with community health workers that can reach people where they live. Now, just to go back to, this is, by the way, what I would call standard results of really good community-based care for any infectious disease. That is, expect very few to die, and also expect not to lose patients to follow up. Now what happened after this is the miraculous part. Um, those making the argument that we needed to have equity front and center, and many AIDS activists were leading this effort, but so too were scientists and physicians arguing that it wasn't true that uh, other interventions would have to do. This is what it changed everything. This is a patient of mine, of ours, a young man from Haiti with, of course, AIDS and tuberculosis, which I discuss in some detail here, meaning the, the, the therapy of two chronic diseases at once, and then a few months later. And many of you may have seen this picture. It's taken by a, former, a, a then HMS student named David Walton. But what happened, of course, the, the initiative that we've described in this paper, which is we call the HIV Equity Initiative, HEI, because we were focused on equity, um, was just a little blip on the screen. But afterwards came the massive and much needed outlays uh, from the United States government, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and also the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. These were the first major infusions of capital into the health problems of poor people in the world and the largest endeavors to promote global health equity in human history. No effort can compare to what has happened here. Not smallpox eradication, not getting the Panama Canal built in the middle of a malaria zone. This is an amazing achievement and all in the space of 10 years. Now, that doesn't mean that the work is over. In 1996, when we knew that antiretroviral therapy worked as did uh, combination chemotherapy for tuberculosis, there was a lot of optimism. But within a year, this is also in Newsweek, you could read articles like the second one in 1997, some patients are too poor to treat. And this is not about Haiti or in Africa. This is about poor people living in the United States, poor Americans, who are not well served when they have chronic disease. Now, most of the uh, lessons we've learned then are, I believe, uh, very opti optimistic ones. With the right kind of uh, support, you can begin to build systems like this, which reach from hospital to clinic into people's home. And um, we can take on what was previously held to be untreatable disease. Now, it's true that a, uh, untreatable uh, disease is potentially possible. But the reason I'm arguing it's not a useful term is I've seen how often the term is really used to describe not treatment failure, but our failure to treat or treat effectively. That is, our delivery failures 
are confused with clinical inefficacy or the lack of available preventives, diagnostics, and therapeutics. Major uh, problem that we're facing. Now I will skip ahead, you'll be happy to learn discussions of drug-resistant HIV disease, which are not dissimilar from those discussed uh, regarding tuberculosis, and close, and open this up for discussion, and close with a brief contemplation of another chronic infection, making the argument, of course, that I'm not really talking about etiology here, but chronicity. Because these lessons, we believe, are very applicable to other chronic pathologies of non-infectious etiology. And that last example is hepatitis C infection, which as you know, most, uh, most infectious disease doctors do not treat hepatitis C, but rather defer to our colleagues in gastroenterology and hepatology. But the story is very much the same, and we have to be concerned. In one cohort of patients that we've followed for years in Siberian uh, prisons, and uh, some of you have visited I know Jeff and I have uh, been to Russia on many occasions, and many, some of you have worked clinically in these settings. Actually, very, uh, very successful work, if you can believe it, and I'll be glad to talk about it in, in afterwards. But the results of interventions to treat tuberculosis, including extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, have been even better in prisons. Now, of course, you're immediately going to say, well, they are a captive audience. <laughs> but about 20% of them in, this one, in one cohort um, are, have HCV infection. And what is our equity plan for them? And Partners in Health does not go into a, a setting to work with its colleagues in the, in this case, the Ministry of Justice or in any community in order to focus on one problem when people have many. It's really to focus on the problems that are being neglected by others, including uh, in our, all of us in our profession. And so we're very concerned, but also very optimistic, because we know that coming down the pike, and in fact already here, are new and more effective agents that are can be administered PO, just like the ART and MDRTV cocktails that I described, and can be delivered, we believe, with the help of community health workers. Um, and I won't go into... Um, uh, clinical details, uh, I, this is again, this is what the equity agenda is. You have new information coming in. This, these are clinical trials uh, that were recently uh, reported in, in the journal that show that we're not going to have to use pegylated interferon and ribavirin uh, with its many complications and its difficulty of uh, administration if we can find better and more effective and well-tolerated oral regimens like the ones, the two protease inhibitors, are about to come online. So the, the argument, which I will close here, is that we have every reason to be optimistic about the future of medicine. We have a lot of exciting discovery happening. We are, de we are seeing new agents and de uh, developed. And delivery is going to be one of our major problems. The results, however, when you build a system for delivery, this is my last slide from Rwanda. Building a system for delivery can't just focus on infectious diseases. Um, people have problems that affect all of them and all of their families. Someone with AIDS may have many other problems, but their family members certainly have other problems. Building integrated health systems that can reach again from patients' homes to clinics and hospitals and can and can take on, for example, non-communicable diseases or chronic illnesses of one sort, we'll be able to take them on for another. And that's what we think is happening in Rwanda. These are the steepest declines in mortality ever registered anywhere in the world. And it's the result of not ignoring infectious killers, but also building, uh, building systems that can respond and prevent other problems. And I just want to say again, Thank you for letting me uh, join you today. I invite you to come visit the new teaching hospital in Haiti, which we have, um, through partnerships with many of you, launched. It's open. It requires a lot of teachers, of specialists, who can work to build up academic medicine 
in Haiti and to rebuild the medical infrastructure destroyed since the earthquake. It is not inside a hospital, as I said, that we need to care for most chronic disease, but we also need hospitals to help us do our, do our job well for complications. Thank you, and I hope we have a few minutes to talk.